We're going to see far fewer city cars on the market in the coming years, which is welcome news for Hyundai, who have reaffirmed their commitment to the segment by introducing this updated version of their popular i10 tiny hatch. It's billed as the most high-tech city car ever. The city car. It's the smallest category of car you could choose, but these days many brands just can't make models this small profitably add up. Hyundai though reckons it can, and to prove it launched the third generation version of its little i10 urban runabout back in 2019, then improved it further in mid 2023 to create the car we're going to look at here. Sometimes the stars just align perfectly for a car manufacturer. Such was the case back in 2009, when two largely unrelated circumstances coincided. The introduction of the government's scrappage scheme saw a number of tired old cars being taken off our roads and resulted in a commensurate quantity of buyers with a modest sum of cash in their hands looking for something to buy. Fairly new onto the market and having just replaced the underwhelming Amica was the rather appealing first generation version of Hyundai's i10. Sales skyrocketed and for a short while the i10 was the country's best selling car. It didn't last. While i10 sales continued quite strongly, the end of the scrappage scheme saw buyers return to their usual buying habits. Since then, Hyundai has tried hard to keep city car buyers interested. It rejuvenated the i10 in second generation form in 2013, but it still didn't quite have the quality or the fashionable appeal of rival Volkswagen Group or PSA Group derived tiny city hatches, or indeed the small city cars then being sold by Ford and Vauxhall. By the time the third generation AC3 series version of this design arrived in 2019 though, all these rivals had disappeared from the market, but a few key competitors still remained. Notably, this i10's almost identically engineered Hyundai Motor Group cousin, the Kia Picanto, plus hybrid versions of the Fiat 500 and Fiat Panda, and Toyota's appealing iGo X. To make sure that this i10 could retain its segment leadership against these competitors and a significantly enhanced Picanto, uh, Hyundai usefully upgraded this car in mid-2023 with an updated look, extra safety features and more equipment. Will that be enough to keep it top of your shopping list if you're seeking a tiny hatch in this class? You'll need the industry's most comprehensive review, the car and driving road test, to find out. Hyundai hasn't introduced any engineering or handling changes with this improved version of the Mark III i10. It didn't really need to. But let's assume that you're not already familiar with this AC3 era design. What's it like behind the wheel? Well, there are a few things you want to tick off as soon as you get yourself seated at the controls of a good city car. The first is visibility. If you're gonna be jinking from lane to lane in the urban jungle, you need great all-round sight lines. This i10 scores well in that regard with good mirrors, windscreen pillars that aren't too obtrusive, and a fairly high seat height. This Mark III model's relatively low front and rear belt lines provide a better view of the road on both sides than you might normally expect a small hatch to offer. And in combination with the minimal C-pillar obscuration means that there's plenty of welcome visibility when performing parking maneuvers. The second point is steering. If there's one thing that instantly takes the shine off a city car, it's a heavy, unresponsive feel at the helm. So it's appropriate that the i10's rack is light and easy, perfect for low speed maneuvering and parking, which is when you'll need the third thing that all tiny urban runabouts really ought to have, a small turning circle. Here it's 4.86 meters, which means fewer than three turns of the wheel lock to lock. So if you spot a parking space on the other side of the road, you'll find that this i10 will be able to quickly change course, 
and drive into it. Another area you might think to be significant in terms of city car segment driving attributes is the ease with which a model of this kind is able to adapt to life beyond the town tarmac. In some ways, prior to 2019, the two earlier generation versions of this i10 coped quite well in this kind of environment. Those models didn't feel too out of their depth on highways, they weren't overly affected by crosswinds and they weren't uh, ear-splittingly noisy at legal limit cruising speeds, not by city car standards anyway. Things weren't quite so good though if the need arose to push on a little on twisting secondary roads. At that point, you quickly realised that the light steering that you'd appreciated so much in the city wasn't telling you very much about what the front wheels were doing. And that the suspension, which seemed so well judged for low speed tarmac tears, got quite unsettled over high speed bumps, enough to make you want to quickly back off. When this Mark III AC3 era i10 arrived in 2019, we didn't really expect these issues to be completely resolved, and they weren't though Hyundai did make a few minor engineering tweaks to improve them. Changes to the rear torsion beam axle to improve stability and a strengthened steering torsion bar to improve steering response which gained a quicker ratio. It didn't add up to much in terms of real world improvement and the result is that this i10 continues to lag a little behind the standards set by key rivals like the Fiat 500 Hybrid and the Toyota Ico X. As usual, beneath the bonnet of an i10, buyers primarily choose between either a three-cylinder, one-litre, 67 PS MPI unit, which makes 62 MPH in 14.6 seconds en route to 97 miles an hour, or the four-cylinder, 1.2-litre, 84 PS Kappa MPI power plant, which is what we have here, a unit that improves those figures to 12.6 seconds and 106 miles an hour, which is a bit more like it. Both engines can be had with either 5-speed manual transmission or a 5-speed automated AMT auto gearbox. To be frank, we'd counsel you to avoid that AMT semi-auto box unless you really are completely urban bound. It's very slow and jerky and when mated to the 1 litre engine slows the rest to 60 mph sprint time to a yawning 17.3 seconds, making an i10 1 litre AMT model one of the very slowest cars it's possible to buy on the UK market. There's a kind of street cred to that I suppose. At the opposite end of the dynamic scale lies the flagship i10 model, the i10 N-Line. Here you get the 1 litre GDI 3 cylinder turbo engine from the larger i20 Super Mini, complete with 100 PS and 172 Newton metres of pulling power. If you don't mind paying Super Mini money for this top variant, you'll find that it can deliver you quite as much spark as you'll need from a car of this kind. And thank goodness it only comes with the 5 speed manual gearbox. Visually, quite a lot's been done here by facelift standards anyway. But of course, nothing really fundamental's changed with the flowing so-called fluidic sculpture styling philosophy of this third generation AC3 era i10 design. There used to be only two ways you could style a city car. One was the small and cute approach championed by models like the Fiat 500. The other represented the more versatile and practical option promised by contenders like earlier Mark I and Mark II versions of this i10. In the last few years though, the waters have been muddied here, a number of new segment contenders proving that style in this sector could be practical and practicality could be stylish. In short, the bar has been raised and for this third generation i10, Hyundai's pen men realised that they'd need to bring us something a touch more characterful, an approach which continues with this facelifted model. Let's start with this Hyundai's practical side, which is most obvious here in profile. It's a bit bigger than the segment norm, 99 millimeters longer than a Fiat 500 hybrid, for instance, and only 95 millimeters shorter than the next model up in the Korean makers range, the i20 Super Mini. There are some clever visual touches too, like this X-shaped C-pillar, which clearly identifies the car 
and draws the eye to the pillar-mounted i10 logo. Hyundai no longer offers a two-tone roof on mainstream models, though you can still have it with top N-line spec, and the Diddy 14-inch wheels have gone. The choice is between now smarter 15-inch rims on the base model or the 16-inch alloys that we have fitted here. The main changes with this facelift Mark III i10, though, can be found here at the front. The grille's been redesigned and the cute little round spotlights that used to adorn the two top corners of it have been replaced by these four little LEDs on each side, built into this appendage's new honeycomb finish. The LED headlamp signature's different too, as is the inner part of each multi-face reflector headlamp. There's a refashioned lower intake and the original model's L-shaped corner cutouts get replaced by these more subtly shaped corner inlets. The creased bonnet flows down into this cleaner rendition of Hyundai's brand logo. There are a few update changes at the rear too, with restyled tail lamp clusters, a new tailgate catch below the revised central brand logo, and a completely different bumper with angled reflectors built into either corner, a reversing lamp built into the left-hand side one. As before, there's a subtle roof spoiler and this neat bee sting style roof antennae. Time to take a seat up front. The facelift budget didn't extend to any significant changes here, but Hyundai has now standardised and improved this 8-inch centre touchscreen display audio infotainment monitor across the range. Plus, the previous analogue dials have been replaced by these trendier, turquoise-framed digital ones. Aware that the original cabin of this Mark III model was rather dull compared to obvious rivals, Hyundai has added some new trimming options, which on this mid-level model include tartan fabric seats with vertical purple lions accompanied by purple touches in the stitching and the air vents. As before we served up intricate corner vents and this trendy mid-level fascia strip which features this honeycombed 3D silvered pattern in front of the passenger, something carried on into the door tops. The emphasis is still very firmly on sensibility rather than street cred and the whole thing still lacking a dash of Toyota Igo X or Fiat 500 style character. But at least now there's a little less of the kind of feeling that you're at the wheel of some sort of domestic appliance. As previously, it feels quite sophisticated in here for an A-segment city car, mainly because of the inclusion of the touchscreen display audio infotainment monitor I mentioned earlier. Though, if you don't add in the optional navigation system we've got here, it doesn't actually do very much. Uh, Bluetooth, a four-speaker DAB audio system, and that's about it. But this doesn't matter on Julie because it includes Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, which is now of the wireless kind, so that you can now more easily pair the screen to your phone handset and get the whole setup to read out messages and access your favorite apps. Uh, there's also now over-the-air updates to keep this monitor current. Upgrade to navigation, and you also get Hyundai's audio video navigation system and an uprated suite of the brand's latest Blue Link connected telematics car services. These operating via a connected app. Between the now digitalized dials in the instrument cluster, there's another much smaller 4.2 inch LCD cluster screen, which now has color inserts, has a neat little lower economy meter and gives you trip computer data, a digital speedo and safety info. Let's also talk about some of the more fundamental aspects of this cabin. The seating position, for example, now, very often in small, tall cars, the designers create extra cabin space by mounting the front seats with rather upright positioning, which can make the driver feel that he or she is perched on rather than in the seat. There's none of that here. In an i10, the positioning is almost as natural and comfortable as it would be in the kind of larger super mini from the next class up that actually wouldn't be a lot bigger than this car in terms of all the dimensions that really matter. There remain a few minor annoyances though, like the way that the wheel only adjusts for height, not for reach, 
which really is almost unacceptable in a modern car, and the fact that seat adjustment must be done with a lever rather than a rotary wheel. What else? Well, the dashboard is as logically laid out as you would expect from a Hyundai, and while some of the plastics are still a little way from the fashionable soft feeling materials that you get on some larger pricier super minis, you know what? It doesn't really matter in a shopping runabout like this. Do you really want to be introducing the weight of a huge slush molded fascia into a city car? Exactly. Anyway, the key touch points seem to us to be pretty nicely fabricated with steering wheel, gear, lever and buttons on the dash functioning with greater quality than you'd normally have any right to expect at this price point. In fact, there's an uncannily Germanic feel to them, which isn't surprising when you remember that the Fatherland is actually where this car was designed. Build quality from the plant at Izmit in Turkey seems solid. Over the shoulder vision is aided by this Mark III design's low belt line and slim C-pillar, plus Hyundai has now standardised the rear view camera too, though if you need something like that to park a car this small, perhaps a visit to the opticians might be recommended. Avoid base trim and you get some uh, big car features too, like a wireless phone charging mat and heat for the steering wheel and the front seats. As for storage space, well, there's a big glove box with a ledge just above, a couple of angled cup holders between the seats, and a deep bin in front of the gear stick uh, with a 12 volt port and both USB-A and USB-C ports just above. The door bins are a bit small, but there's an angled recess below the gear stick, another in the door pulls, a narrow cubby by the handbrake, uh, with a USB-C port just behind. There are vanity mirrors in both sun visors and a ticket clip on the facing side of the driver's sun visor. Right, let's take a look in the back seat. As part of the original design of this Mark III model, Hyundai increased this i10's wheelbase by 40 millimeters, pushing the wheels further out to the corners so as to improve cabin space. And that's paid dividends in the back. This i10 was always a good pick if you wanted a city car with an interior nearly as big as a super mini. And with this third generation design, that's even more the case. Hyundai reckons that a couple of big six foot adults will be quite comfortable in the rear. That's quite an achievement for a car of this kind. And at a pinch, you might even fit a third person in two. Legroom will of course be at a bit of a premium. This car is after all only 3.67 meters in overall length, but these recesses in the front seat backs help. The optional shell gray center light colored seat facings will mark easily, so choose your trim carefully if you've messy children. The door bins are very reasonably sized for a city car and rear folk can also use this little cubby behind the handbrake. There's a cubby in the door pulls and upper coat hooks in the roof lining. Isofix child seat attachments are on the two outer seats. Out back, the decently sized 252 litre boot remains big, though it's not class leading because the closely related Kia Picanto offers 255 litres. For reference, there's 231 litres in a Toyota Igo X and just 185 litres in a Fiat 500 hybrid. Essentially, you're getting, well, almost a trunk that's uh, pretty much as big as that of a super mini here. Uh, that of a uh, Hyundai i10 is 352 litres, for example. And you can fit three carry-on suitcases into it below the parcel shelf, though there's a fairly high loading lip to negotiate to get them in. There are two bag hooks, a light on the left, and a bit more space under the floor around the tyre repair kit. Push the 60-40 split backrest down, which Hyundai claims can be done one-handed, and capacity rises to 1,050 litres. At the time of our test in early 2024, item pricing started at around £15,500, which is around £2,500 more than it was when we first tested this AC3 era design back in 2019, and way over double what the first generation version of this car cost when it debuted back in 2007. 
your wage slip probably hasn't become 100% bigger in that time, but c'est la vie. Anyway, that base figure applies to the base advance level of trim. Most will stretch to the mid-range premium spec we have here, costing £1,300 more. The four-cylinder, 84 PS, 1.2 litre MPI engine we're trying today costs £800 more than the base 67 PS MPI 1 litre unit. Prices, as we filmed, were starting from just over £16,000. Now with both engines, you've the option of paying your dealer £650 more to get the AMT five-speed automated gearbox with this car if you feel you simply have to have an auto. For a well-specified 1.2 litre premium manual variant like the one we have here, you'd have been looking at just over 17 and a half thousand pounds as we filmed. The rare one litre T N-line turbo flagship model that hardly anyone chooses cost from just over 18,000 pounds at the time of this review. All versions of this Hyundai only come with this five door body style. Now, the inclusion of more powerful engines in the i10 range, like this 1.2 litre unit, are significant because none of this Hyundai's rivals offer anything much more than around 70 horsepower. So all compete with the base one litre version of this model. As we filmed, the equivalent Kia Picanto was able to undercut a one litre i10 by around 1700 pounds, but was just about to be significantly updated. So you can expect that differential to be substantially reduced by the time you come to view this film and make your own comparisons. As for other rivals, uh, well, you'd save around a thousand pounds with an MG3, but lose a lot of that with high running costs. The better alternative is Fiat's Panda, which, as we filmed, would save you around £700 over an item but offers less equipment. You may also want to include cars like the Dacia Sandero and the Citroen C3U into your deliberations, but they're both really larger super minis from the next class up, which is good in terms of cabin and boot space, but bad in terms of running costs. A more natural rival is the Toyota Igo X, which costs around 500 pounds more than an i10, but throws in a visual crossover vibe, which you might not necessarily like. We also ought to mention the Fiat 500 Hybrid, though that now costs around 1500 pounds more than this Hyundai, is much smaller inside and only comes with three doors. If having considered all of that, you conclude, understandably, that there's nothing quite like an i10, then you'll need to know just how generous Hyundai has been with standard spec. So let's take a look at that now. Even the base advanced model gets 15 inch alloy wheels, powered heated mirrors, rear parking sensors, an alarm and auto headlamps. Plus there are digitalized instrument gauges separated by a 4.2 inch LCD instrument cluster display. Media connectivity comes courtesy of an 8-inch touchscreen display audio system with smart device integration. This better quality infotainment setup now comes with wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, as well as Bluetooth voice recognition, uh, also a rear view camera and a four-speaker DAB audio system. Here we've got the mid-level premium spec model that you'll probably want, identifiable by its larger 16-inch wheels, bifunction projection headlamps, front fog lights, privacy glass, and if you're really eagle-eyed, 13-inch rear brake discs. Premium spec also gets you heat for the front seats and steering wheel, a wireless charging mat, climate-controlled air conditioning, blue ambient mood lighting, power folding mirrors, keyless entry, and smarter tartan seat trim. We should also mention the top N-Line model, which is the only one that you can order with Hyundai's one litre TGDI three-cylinder turbo petrol engine. Here, exterior design enhancements include unique bumpers and grille. Uh, that gives a more dynamic look um, that's supposed to have been inspired by Hyundai's engagement in motorsport. And N-Line buyers also get unique seat trim and exclusive 16-inch alloy wheels, plus an I-10 sign in red font, as well as a skid plate and diffuser. There aren't many options, which is just as well, given that virtually all the paint colors cost extra. There are actually now nine exterior colors, two of which are new. Lumen Grey, which is what we have here, 
a bright and light grey colour with a pearl finish, and Meta Blue with its bluish violet colour reflections and pearl finish. Avoid base trim and you'll be able to add navigation for £800 more, but uh, using a free smartphone app via the improved smart device integration system seems to make much more sense. On the N-Line version, you can add a two-tone black roof too. On to safety. This Mark III i10 didn't do particularly well when subjected to NCAP tests back in 2020, scoring just three stars out of five. Apparently there were some issues around driver protection in a side impact crash situation. Since then though, Hyundai's ramped up its smart sense safety tally on this car and refreshingly, a high level of camera safety kit is now standard whichever trim level you buy into. That's been enhanced with this improved model. This car's forward collision avoidance assist autonomous braking system now has pedestrian and cyclist detection. Plus, there's now intelligent speed limit assist offered as standard. And lane follow assist, which works with the car's standard cruise control system and uses a camera to keep your I-10 centered in lane, working between zero and 81 miles an hour, alerting you if you drift over lane markings. There's also now leading vehicle departure alert, so that in an urban queue, when the vehicle in front moves off, so will you. As before, this I-10 comes with lane departure warning, complete with lane keep assist, which will apply subtle steering lock to ease you back to where you ought to be if you drift out of your lane on the highway. As you'd hope, there's driver attention alert, which monitors your driving reactions for drowsiness and will alert you if it thinks you need to stop for a restorative coffee. More common city car safety features include front, side and curtain airbags linked to an e-call system which alerts the emergency services with your GPS location should any of the bags go off. As usual, there's a brake assist system for emergency stops, heel start assist control, electronic stability control and a tyre pressure monitoring system. Finally, rear occupant alert reminds the driver with a message in the cluster if the rear door has been opened during the journey uh, to prevent anyone or anything in the rear seat from being left behind. This Mark III i10 hasn't gained any of Hyundai's latest mild hybrid tech in this improved form, but it still shouldn't cost much to run. Let's get to the WLTP figures. The one litre, three cylinder MPI manual variant manages 54.3 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 119 grams per kilometre of CO2 emissions. For the one litre AMT Auto, you're looking at 51.4 miles to the gallon and a 126 grams per kilometre CO2 figure. Now to be frank, these aren't particularly amazing figures. A rival Toyota Igo X, for instance, manages 16.1 miles to the gallon and 109 grams per kilometer. For the four cylinder 1.2 litre i10 variant that we're trying here, it's 52.3 miles to the gallon and 124 grams per kilometer for the manual model and 49.6 miles to the gallon and 129 grams per kilometer for the auto. There'll be a fractional reduction in the figures just quoted if you opt for the top one litre TGDI Turbo N-Line Manual Turbo Sporting variant, which records 123 grams per kilometre of CO2. The idle stop and go ISG is a standard feature for all powertrains, which contributes to lower fuel consumption, lower CO2 emissions, and higher efficiency. The fuel savings of using the ISG system are particularly apparent when driving in urban areas as the ISG automatically switches off the engine when the car comes to a halt. There's even an instrument cluster display to tell you how long the stop and go feature has been in operation in any given journey. Now actually I can't really think why you'd ever want to know that. Satisfied owners will tell you that the i10 proposition is about a whole lot more than just a five-year warranty with a car thrown in for good measure. But there's no doubt that the comprehensive after-sales package does remain a major attraction for city segment customers. 
it's a really good unlimited mileage deal that also includes annual vehicle health checks and roadside assistance to add peace of mind. You might not think that it's quite as good as the seven year 100,000 mile warranty that you get with an alternative Kia Picanto though. You can budget ahead for garage visits by opting for one of the Korean company's fixed price servicing plans. There's a three year package that covers you for up to 30,000 miles or a five year program that extends that to as much as 50,000 miles. Insurance groupings start from two with the one litre version or from group six with this 1.2. Arrival IGO X falls into groups five or six. As for residuals, well, after three years and 36,000 miles, independent experts reckon your i10 will hang on to around 53% of its original value, which is about 4% better than its close Kia Picanto cousin. Having seen off many of its main segment rivals, this improved Mark III Model i10 looks set to consolidate its strong position in the city car segment. Try one of these and it's genuinely hard to imagine why you'd want to pay a lot more for a coarser sized Super Mini. This little Hyundai gives you almost as much rear passenger room and boot space as one of those, but will cost less to run and will be easier to park. Now that its cabin has been slightly upgraded, you don't even feel too much like you've bought into a budget segment car either. It's not perfect, of course. You'll get better efficiency stats elsewhere in this segment and a more charismatic look. But this i10 is still very affordable to run and it now looks a little more eye-catching. In summary, city cars have evolved. These used to be models people went for uh, because they had to. Now so often their little runabouts customers own out of choice. For all the industry plaudits the affordable little first and second generation i10 models received, they weren't cars you'd ever have felt especially joyful about owning. But specified correctly, this improved third generation version just might be.